And now it's time for us to take a closer look at some of those headlines and simple keywords. And Adam joining us on the line. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. Happy hump day. <laughs> Did you have to look at the calendar was, to I double check? <laughs> I just, yeah, I was a bit confused for a second there. But yes, happy Wednesday. To be fair, it was a pretty long news cycle for us in the country yeah. yesterday. So it was a long uh, day. <laughs> it has been. It has been a very busy one, hasn't it? <laughs> We'll get to the details of why that was in just a moment. Actually, let's jump right in. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. All right, this is our keyword news portion. As always, we're going to try to simplify some of these headlines for you, starting with our first pick of the day. Oath of office. So this is why we were all very busy. Uh, Yoon Sung-yeol has taken the oath of office uh, and he became president of South Korea. He's off to a busy start as a 20th president of the country. What did he have to say in his inauguration speech? It does seem like some words uh, appeared more frequently in his speech than others. Yeah, a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit noticeably, yes. Uh, he prioritized uh, liberal democracy and market economy and he said he believed freedom and rapid growth can resolve the multiple challenges the nation faces. Now, freedom seemed to be the kind of the main theme uh, of the speech. Uh, freedom is a universal value, he said. He went on to say that every citizen and every member of society must be able to enjoy freedom. If one's freedom is infringed upon or left uncorrected, this is an assault on everyone's freedom. Now, he <laughs> mentioned the word freedom 35 times. Uh, so, to uh, to yeah. be fair, I do think he's inheriting a, an increasingly divided country. And I think maybe the purpose of that was to extend that that freedom is universal and it's to be extended to every citizen, no matter where they stand on the political spectrum. But like you said, 30 five times. A lot of headlines are just covering yeah. that fact. Um, of course, there's yeah. also really pressing issues uh, the UN administration has inherited, like, for example, how to deal with North Korea. And they seem yeah. to have proposed something a little unexpected, a package of economic incentives. Yeah, so it's quite unusual because Yoon sung kind of had like this hardline stance right. uh, on North Korea during the campaign. But uh, similar to, kind of similar to what the Moon Jae-in administration uh, proposed, Yoon sung also placed to kind of strengthen North Korea's economy if it embarks on the denuclearization process. So mm. there is a condition to it. Mm. Um, and he also... Uh, vowed to build a nation that fulfills its responsibility as a trusted member of the international community uh, and a nation that truly belongs to the people. So I think mm. he's trying to get a uh, stronger uh, or make Korea have a stronger foothold in the international community in order to possibly achieve uh, or resolve issues surrounding mm. North Korea as well. Right. So. Um, uh, 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 kind of approaching that issue on a diplomatic front. Mm. Now, Yoon believes that division and social conflict uh, plaguing Korea society and threatening freedom uh, and liberal democratic order can overcome uh, can be overcome with rapid and sustainable growth as well. Uh, the new president said it was critical that the nation achieved rapid growth and that it would be, only be possible through science, technology and inf innovation. So probably hinting that he's going to uh, focus more on future oriented industries. Um, and uh, going back to North Korea, he said the door to dialogue will remain open to p peacefully resolve the nuclear issue. So mm. again, uh, an apparent olive uh, branch to the north. Mm. Um, and meanwhile, his cabinet isn't complete just yet. So that's why he signed a motion asking the National Assembly to approve Prime Minister nominee Han Dok Su. Mm. Uh, now, the Democratic Party has been trying, which is now the main opposition, has been trying to block Han's uh, appointment. It's kind of becoming a very contentious issue in Parliament. Mm. Uh, and unlike other ministers, the president needs parliamentary approval to appoint mm. uh, the prime minister. Uh, but for others, he doesn't really need to do so. And that's why he appointed seven cabinet members and presidential secretaries uh, soon after signing the motion. Hmm. All right. And uh, in related uh, news, let's move on to our second keyword of the day. Diplomatic debut. So Yunus had a very busy first day, which included his diplomatic debut as president at back-to-back one-on-one meetings. Who did he meet with and how did these meetings go? Right. Well, he met with the foreign delegations visiting Korea to attend his inauguration. Started off with the U.S. Second Gentleman Douglas Emhoff, the wife of Vice, uh, U.S. Vice President the Kamala Harris. <laughs> yeah. Oh, husband. sorry, the husband. Excuse me. <laughs> no my problem. gosh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. He is the first uh, male in his role, actually. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. 
Uh, and he also met with China, Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan and Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi. Mm. Now, other foreign dignitaries included Singaporean President Halima Yaqob and also representatives of the United Arab Emirates. Now, following the ceremony, Yoon met with Emhoff and other members of the U.S. delegation, uh, with, of which there are, I think, eight. Um, F- Emhoff said he was honoured to become the first diplomatic guest at the new presidential house in Yongshan. That's mm. where, of course, the official duties began. Uh, he then delivered a congratulatory letter from Biden to Yoon, and it outlined Biden's will to work closely with Yoon over the next five years. Uh, Yoon, for his part, said the strong alliance between the two countries has helped South Korea prosper, and he expects the alliance will continue to flourish. Um, now, the meeting kind of serves as a prelude to Biden's trip to Korea in a week and a half's time, in fact. Mm. So. That kind of set that in motion. Mm. Uh, now he met uh, Yoon met then with Japan's foreign minister Yoshimasa Hayashi. Uh, it's the first time that a Japanese foreign minister has actually come to Seoul since Tano Kono's visit in June 2018. Uh, Hayashi also had a letter from the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida to hand to Yoon, uh, and Yoon responded that he looks forward to working with Kishida to improve bilateral ties, mm. and he also said he expects to see. Kushida soon, so there's probably uh, a summit between Korea and Japan in the mm. pipeline, probably mm. to improve mm. uh, bilateral relations. Mm. And Kushida too expressed his hope for a recovery of diplomatic relations as well. Mm. Um, now, Yoon then met with delegates from the UAE and was invited to visit the Middle Eastern country. Now, should Yoon travel to the UAE, he'll actually become the first South Korean president to do so. Mm. Um, so uh, we'll have to wait and see if that does come into fruition. Um, Yoon then met with Chinese uh, Vice President Wang Shishang, uh, asked about Wang's trip to South Korea. The Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian noted that China and the ROK are and will remain close neighbours. Now, Wang's trip is seen as China's government's uh, decision to kind of counter Seoul Washington relations in the region. Mm. Yoon Song Yeol has kind of steered more towards the US in terms mm. of diplomatic relations. Mm. Now, Wang has kind of little formal power as China's vice president, but he is very influential, uh, influential due to his close relationship with uh, the Chinese leader Xi Jinping, and he is actually one of the highest. Uh, officials to visit South Korea for an inauguration for a new president here. So mm. that in itself is uh, quite significant. Uh, diplomatically, that seems to be an important symbol too. Uh, let's move on to what's happening at home for us continuously. This is our third keyword of the day. Extra budget. So the government of President Yoon Song Yeol plans to propose an extra budget estimated around 35 trillion won this week, mostly from what I understand geared towards uh, providing relief for those who are hit hardest by the pandemic restrictions like small business owners. That's right. So the the aim of it is very similar to what the Moon Jae-in administration uh, mm. set out to do uh, during his presidency. Uh, and the finance ministry, ministry plans to unveil the details about this year's second extra budget tomorrow, uh, including the exact size of the relief fund that will be handed out to these merchants. And the UN government will likely dole out most of the funds in cash. Uh, The new government is also expected to announce a set of measures to ease the burden of high inflation of people uh, as well. As we know, inflation has been uh, soaring to kind of crazy levels recently, Mm. not just Mm. at home, but around the world. Uh, And during the election campaign, Yoon promised to spend around 50 trillion won, in fact, to compensate the self-employed, but it has kind of been downgraded. Uh, the, the now dissolved transition team estimates a fall of some 54 trillion won in the income of the self-employed. So there's kind of a pressing issue that the UN government is trying to tackle uh, head on to begin with. Um, each beneficiary will be eligible to receive funds equivalent to the difference between the financial damage they suffered during the 2020 to 2021 period of the pandemic and the amount they received from the previous administration in disaster relief over the same period. Now, for instance, a business owner could receive 5 million won from the government if their total financial damage accounts to 30 million won during that period mentioned, Mm. and they received 25 million won by the Moon administration. So, of course, the difference being 5 million won. Mm. Now, how the supplementary budget will be financed, uh, of course, will be a critical issue, considering the fact that national debt snowballed during the Moon's presidency because there was... Mm. Uh, about half a dozen extra budget bills that were signed during Mm. that period because of the pandemic.
The newly appointed finance minister Chu Kyung Ho, um, awaiting his appointment, had said, uh, "Well, to just uh, maybe draw attention, Chu Kyung Ho is still on Chu Kyung Ho. He's, you yeah. know, kind of was a play on words, right? That yeah. he wasn't a too big of a fan of doubling down on these supplementary budgets. But it does seem like it's a priority for the incoming UN administration. So that yeah. has shifted a little bit." It has a little bit, yes. <laughs> On to our fourth keyword of the day. Common objective. So the U.S. has been quick to reiterate its alliance with South Korea, saying it will work with a new government to achieve North Korea's denuclearization. The end and goal is the same, and so they're in line with the United States' agenda, too. Yeah, it's pretty much a reiteration of what uh, any U.S. government says when a new South Korean government comes into place. Uh, And the U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said Seoul and Washington do share a common objective of completely denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula and will continue to coordinate closely on ways to achieve that goal. Now, Moon, uh, sorry, Price made the remarks after uh, Yoon Sung uh, said his government will revive the North Korean economy. Uh, with that condition that it gives up its nuclear ambitions. Now, Price said the U.S. looks forward to the opportunities ahead over the phone and in person, including when Biden visits South Korea. And he said discussions on advancing and promoting denuclearization would continue with the new UN government. Now, eyes are on what North Korea policies the UN administration will come up with and how they'll be coordinated with the U.S., Uh, Yoon has had a pretty hardline stance on the North, although it kind of seemed to be died down during his inauguration address. Mm. Uh, And his basic uh, stance has been similar to his conservative predecessors, namely uh, Park Geun-hye and Lee Myung-bak. Now, but during the, yeah, uh, but he has dialed a little bit down uh, back on those comments, uh, expressing a willingness to engage in dialogue again. Um, and that's also a position the U.S. has been maintaining as well. Because if, uh, if, if my all... memory serves me correctly, uh, when conservatives tried that strategy in the mid-2000s, right, enforcing sanctions, incredibly hardline policies, it did backfire. Uh, North Korea responded with some of its most serious military provocations. And so yeah. it, maybe it's a balance between the two approaches that we're just talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah, so I think Yun Sung Gyal uh, is trying to take, yes, that kind of middle ground. Right. But of course, no details on the policies right. that have been set out uh, yet. So we'll have to wait and see what do come out. But of course, uh, a lot of watchers are saying it won't be an easy road ahead. So it hasn't been uh, all this time. Uh, North Korea has avoided denuclearization talks since late 2019. So it's been a few years. And it's also ignored U.S. overtures since uh, Biden took office early last year. Um, and Price reiterated U.S. concerns over North Korea's continuing provocations, of which there have been a lot this year. Mm. Uh, and uh, the U.S. State Department uh, is also kind of predicting a nuclear test before the end of the month as well. Mm. So we'll have to see if North Korea does conduct one. Of course, the backlash uh, will come uh, very quickly. All right. We'll have to wait and see. And finally, on to our last keyword of the day. War in Ukraine. So we're getting the latest from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Kremlin forces have launched an offensive against a crucial Black Sea city, a port city. Uh, What's the latest? Right. Well, Russia fired a barrage of missiles at Odessa on Monday, which hit a a shopping center and a warehouse. It's said to have killed one person and injured uh, a couple others. Uh, The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, warned that the blockade of the port and others like it was threatening the world's food supply. Uh, and urgently called for help. Now, the attack was an apparent effort to disrupt supply lines, in fact, and Western weapons shipments, critical to Kyiv's defense as well. Mm -hmm. Now, European Council President Charles Michel actually visited Odessa on Monday, and his meeting with the Ukrainian Prime Minister was actually interrupted by a missile attack, and they had to continue their talks in a bomb shelter. Um, And Michel said he saw silos full of grain, wheat and corn that were unable to be exported. So that's why Zelensky is saying uh, that these blockades should be lifted. Now, meanwhile, in Izium, the uh, bodies of 44 civilians have been found in the rubble of a collapsed building in the Ukrainian uh, city. Uh, The stark reality of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is kind of becoming increasingly apparent uh, in terms of economic value. Russia's economy, uh, which have been hit by international sanctions... Uh, is expected to contract about 10% uh, this year. But the Ukrainian uh, economy is expected to shrink about 30%, according to European estimates. Mm. And uh, the US seem, uh, or predicts that there's going to be uh, no real signs of the war dying down, actually escalating, in fact, mm. uh, 
That's from the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, uh, Avril Haines, uh, which, who was speaking to the Senate uh, hearing. So we'll have to see uh, what developments come out of the Ukraine conflict as time goes by. Thank you very much, Aaron, for a thorough coverage this morning. Have a safe day and we'll speak to you again tomorrow. You too. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.